All three of us are going to talk this morning. We're going to go in the order of most beautiful, at least beautiful to most beautiful. Before you laugh, Derek, you went first. <laughs> so I bring you greetings from your sister church in Saipan. It's on the big island of Palawan in the Philippines this morning. And um, I just want, I want you to know that you have another church on the other side of the world that we worship in about 13 or so hours, just like we are here. Um, before we start this morning, I'd like you to bow your head one more time. Our Heavenly Father, this morning as we share our mission trip to the Philippines, I want the Holy Spirit to move freely in this place and help us to uh, clearly convey the need for missions. And Heavenly Father, just be with those that you left behind in the Philippines. Uh, just be with us today, I pray in Amen. <clears throat> I got a little talking to do before we get to that point, because I have the first nine days of the trip, and uh, it actually starts on Sunday. Well, actually, it goes back to October uh, last year. We were at uh, Dave and Sherry Armisen's at Cornrows there, and, and Travis came up to me and said, uh, we had been talking about mission trips before, he said, I got a trip uh, coming up in March, or we're going to be going to the Philippines, are you interested? And I said, yes. I'm interested. And so by the time the cornrows had ended, uh, people knew that I was going there and uh, I hadn't told my wife. And so she, that <laughs> would be probably the best idea that she could come up with. But when God speaks, you, you just do that. Uh, here I am, let's go. Um, <clears throat> so then I went and talked to Alex and he said, yes, he's interested in going. And Alex talked to his friend Jade and I went Walla Walla and he said, yes, I'm interested in going. So. Right then we had three, and, and it took just a few months of riding to talk to Shell into going. And she said, what can I do there? And little did she know uh, what she would be doing. She would be really a little girl's full of cement and that sort of thing. And so I'm not going to get into her part because, because uh, she's going to be talking. But, but that uh, is one of the things that you'll be expected to do when you go on a mission trip with Travis is you're going to work hard. And uh, one good thing about working hard on a mission trip is you don't come back wishing that you work harder when you were there. Uh, you did it all over the table. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, Sunday before we were ready to leave to go to the Philippines, uh, Michelle took me and Alex down to the airport in Chicago where we spent the night because we were going to go a week before Michelle uh, because her vacation wasn't as long as ours was. And so we were going to go for a little over three weeks and she was going to come for a little over two weeks. And exactly a week apart for her so we stayed Sunday night at the motel in Chicago, and then Monday morning at about 9 o'clock, the shuttle came to pick us up to take us to the airport. And on the way from the airport, from the hotel to the airport on the shuttle, uh, we had a quite a wild ride. We had 19 moving violations in about 15 miles with our with our drivers. So I thought, well, this is great. We already have a story for in case nothing exciting happens <laughs> on our trip, and so. I thought, well, that'll make it all work out. And I was looking for, why are you doing this? And so that was one of the areas where I thought, this is cool. So anyway, we jumped right into this mission trip, not knowing what we would be doing when we got there. We had no idea. We didn't know what kind of materials we were working with. Uh, almost nothing. And so when I went to pack my bags to go, I just started putting stuff in there, not knowing what we might or might not use, and it turns out that I put pliers in there, we used them, I put uh, vice grip clamps in there, we used them, I put hand saws in there, we used them, everything that went in the bedding was used, and, and uh, God has a funny way about uh, just making sure that you know that you have what you need. Actually, uh, when we got there, they hadn't had what they needed, so Travis uh, got in contact with Amanda had his work and said, can you contact Jeff and Michelle and Alex and see if they can bring some tools down here that we need. And so uh, Amanda called and she said, uh, we have a German saw. That's a pretty big saw. The box is about as wide as this and about this tall. And uh, they said, can you bring that? And I said, sure, we can bring it. And they said, you have extra costs involved with your, with your uh, baggage and that. We'll take care of it when you get here. No problem. So, but they had previously tried to get the saw there with uh, Kevin Borschinger from the uh, Wilson Church, him and his son were there. And the first saw arrived, it had 
previously had gas in the gas line, even though it was a new saw. So they wouldn't allow it to be on the, on the plane, so they had to go up to the airport, pick up that one, and then they and then they had to arrange for us to get a saw that had never had gas in it. So, so we got that. We loaded it all up, all our bags, and we got to the airport. And we loaded up um, to uh, Korean Airlines, and I can't stress high enough how terrible Korean Airlines might sound, but how wonderful of an airline it is, because this is South Korea and not North Korea. And so you fly this beautiful airline into Seoul. Uh, this airport in Seoul, Korea is first class all the way. I've never been in a nicer airport, and uh, it would be hard pressed to find a nicer one. There's a lot of good things about it. Kristen can tell you those things too. Because um, we stayed at the same airport that, that they did. While we were at the airport in Seoul, we ran into Jaden, now it's his friend from all along. He was coming in on a different flight. We had kind of an idea where he might be in the airport, so we started to walk that way, but it's a big airport, it's not, it's not a little thing. And uh, I had asked Alex what this Jaden looked like, because I'd never seen him before. I might have seen him on Skype or something one time, but I didn't remember him. And they started to talk about this big talk on it's just like that guy right over there. So we went over there and here was Jaden. So we got together for a little while, but then Jaden had a different flight from Seoul. We flew to Manila, and Jaden had a different flight on that leg of the journey. So we had to meet up with him again at, at uh, Manila. Uh, once again, got back on Korean Airlines for about four hours, and then we flew into Manila. And from Seoul to Manila is the whole part in the way the airports are. Probably the worst airport in the world was in Manila. Um, it's spread out over many miles. I think they probably forgot the plan for expansion when they built it or whatever, because you have to get on, on uh, different kinds of vehicles and buses and transits and stuff to get to different places at the airport, to different terminals, and you have to collect your baggage and take it with you. You don't just get off the plane and go to your next plane and have to get your baggage, take it to the next plane. So, that was really a challenge. So, and, and we got there in the middle of the night, and there's thousands of people in the airport, and they're all sitting around waiting for the check in desk to open. And it was okay with us because we had three of us we had me and Alex and Jaden. So, if somebody had to go to the bathroom or something, the other person could wash the baggage. But we were thinking back, Michelle will be coming next week, and she won't have anybody to wash her baggage or anything. So, we already started to devise a plan in our head that we would. Have Alex fly back to Manila uh, and meet up with her so that she could get to the airport safely. So, we got on the plane in Manila, and um, while we were at Seoul, I think it was while we were still at Seoul, we had the opportunity to go on the internet and pick our flight, our seat on our flight from Manila to Port Princesa. It's, a short, it's an hour and 15 minute flight, we have a long flight. But so Alex got on the computer and we looked and there was only 12 seats on the plane. Must be a little bubble jump that just takes you across, is what we thought. So we put two seats on it and, and uh, we, got, we got on, well, and Jaden was on the same flight with us, but it's a little funny because uh, what happened was the two seats that we picked happened to be in first class. It did not show any of the other seats on that plane, so we thought it was a 12 seater, but it was actually a big plane. And that's important because in first class, uh, you get to have more baggage. Um, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> we, uh, we went to check in and, and we had this big German saw and we had all this other stuff. We were quite a bit over the size that we should have been. And so, but because we're in first class, our stuff got to fly for free, which is what we were expecting to pay for. <clears throat> So we got, we got to Port Princess early in the morning on Wednesday, that would have been up. And uh, Travis and Michelle were there to pick us up at the airport. And the picture you see now is us leaving the airport at uh, Port Princess heading for Saipan again. And we're in the truck with Travis. You can see all the trikes. Another stuff there on the screen. <clears throat> uh, 
Okay, so we got to the, the compound where we were going to be staying, and this is the accommodations that we had. It's actually a quite a nice little chicken coop, but we used it as a house. And you see the part at the top there with the crosshatch bamboo stuff there, that bench sticking out there, that's where Jaden slept on that. He's about six feet seven inches tall. His feet go almost from one end to the other, and his width is a little bit wider than the, he's a skinny fellow, but still his width is a little bit wider than that ledge that you can see there. Um, but that's where Jaden slept, and uh, we slept on a bunk bed, but again, the far right side of that building that you're seeing, that building from the back side there. So we went out to the job site the first day uh, when we got there. We got to about 10 o'clock in the morning, and from 10 to about noon or whenever it was that they decided they would eat, uh, me and Jaden and Alex laid blocks. We laid about three rows of blocks on one of these uh, parts of the structure, and then we were instructed after dinner that we were not to go back up to the job site because uh, they knew better than us. We thought we could go back out to work again, and so they, got the, they said, we need you tomorrow and we need you the next day, so today you will go and take a nap. So, and that, in that little hut that you see there, I slept one way on the ledge because there was somebody already still in the room with the bunk beds. I slept one way on the ledge, Jaden slept the other way on the ledge, and Alex slept on a bench that was on the floor uh, that afternoon. But by the time the evening came around, they, they fixed us up. So here's the building that we were working on. You can see the one in the right yellow there on the left hand side uh, is either Travis or Kevin Borshin here, they both had that color in it from time to time. There was about uh, 17, I think, young people and, and uh, extras from Okanagan uh, Adventist Academy in British Columbia. They, uh, they came out there, and the first day we were there, because they were just really getting started, they, they, Travis and Michelle and, and Bill and Laura and the group had already put the footings in. And, the building. When we got there, there was one wall that had been started, and uh, so we started with, with the one wall where they did about three rows of blocks. So this is a little bit farther on in the picture already. But the group from Okanagan Academy, um, I noticed the first day that there wasn't a lot for everybody to be doing because there were so many and so few people leading out. So, hey, who's that? Um, so the next day, little did I know that we made them three rows of blocks, that that would be the last block that would be on this job, because there's, there's thousands of blocks in this building. Every wall is blocked, the, the closets are blocked, the bathrooms are blocked, the whole thing is blocked. But if you see in the picture there, that's myself and Alex, and on the second day that we worked, which would be Thursday, me, Alex, and Jaden were assigned the job of framing all the windows. And so you can see just on the, is that, and on the right side, on the right side, you'll see on the bottom of the window frame, you'll see a little ledge of cement port. That's what we did. We run around to each window frame. I don't know nothing about this stuff. <laughs> we went around to each window frame and we formed the bottom like that because what they did was they left the window windows frame eight inches wider and eight inches taller than they needed to be up there about on the tall side. And because the blocks were so rough and, and uneven, you couldn't just lay them up to the opening and expect to go into the pits, so what they did was we poured cement completely around the block. And that's what we're doing on the, on the picture that's on the left, where me and Alex are standing there, we're actually starting to form the side of it. We poured all the bottoms first, and then we poured the sides and the tops together. This picture here is of one of the young people, uh, they block Travis and uh, Kevin did a really good job of utilizing young people, making sure that they uh, got a chance to lay some blocks. They were, they were mixing concrete, they were cutting reed bars. You'll see in that picture one of the uh, people from the uh, academy up there in Canada was using that. That's the German saw right there in the picture that we brought. He's using that to cut some blocks, but they also use that same saw for cutting the green bars. Before we got there, all they had was a four-inch angle grinder that they used for cutting everything, for the blocks, for the and for the green bars. And uh, it wasn't going too good, so they were pretty happy that uh, that, that machine 
being showed up. On the second day, and it doesn't show this in the picture, but on the second day, I, um, I decided that, that Alex and Jaden were far enough along in their tutoring of how to do the window frames that I decided that uh, they would need to work by themselves. I would start a frame and then move on to the next one. And I took one of the young people from the Okanagan Academy. Her name was Taylor, and she worked with me on the second day. And we noticed the first day she, she didn't have that to do, so she was really excited to. And they worked hard. Uh, I was really pleased with how hard they could work when somebody gave them something to do. There's Kevin Borschinger. A lot of you that are here know him. He's from the Boston Church. Him and his son Solomon are there. Uh, Solomon, he's quite a, quite a fellow, isn't he? Anyway, uh, I shouldn't tell this part, but I'm going to. Uh, there was a monkey there. That, or, I didn't say much about our accommodations, but. They had a couple monkeys there and a lot of different animals and stuff there. And that first week there was a monkey there and we learned right away you don't go by the monkey. One of them, they're both tied up and they got to go. One of them was getting a sore from his collar so they put him in a cage. The other monkey loved Travis, loved a couple people, but most people they could not be trusted with. So we had a circle that we did not win because we did not want to be near the monkey. Well, it was just like the, uh, the circle that they guarded the Eden. The, Monkey kept calling out to Solomon, come over by me. And uh, the third time that he got bit by the monkey, I, I, I didn't have to apologize to him. I, I couldn't help but laugh a little bit. And I know that's evil, but that's what happened. Here we are working on the window frames again. There's the monkey. Over there. Yeah. Oh. Over there in the Philippines, um, that's not Travis, that is actually Steven Seagal. Um, they really do think that he is Steven Seagal over there. Uh, I guess when you watch a movie, you don't realize that the person that's in the movie has aged another 30 years since that movie was made. So he's a very young Steven Seagal, but, but Travis is the man in, in several different species. Monkeys love him. He had a chicken that uh, Henny Penny that, that loved him, and, and the ducks were his friends, and so uh, yeah, he's the man. I, I was hoping to have him here today, but they're up in Alaska on vacation, uh, trying to avoid getting uh, embarrassed. I believe. This is called the uh, chariot. This is how some of us got around at times. All materials back and forth. All people back and forth went into town. The picture of the chariot that shows Jaden, Jaden driving the chariot. That was quite awesome. He, he, um, he wanted to go into uh, Aborda, which is a village about seven kilometers down the road or whatever, not real far away. And we didn't have a driver for hours. And they asked me to drive, and I said, there's no way. I'm driving that thing. I mean, it sounds like a tank, but it's no longer, it only goes about as fast as a tank, too. But it seems a lot faster when you're in it. But there's Jaden, is the one not driving, and then Alex is there, and then you'll see the bright teeth in the window. That's that's fun. That's um, Edgar and Raylene's son, the pastor that's there. And there's me trying to keep from falling out of the back. That's, um, you know, it's quite, quite an adventure. And the next one. This is the building about well, three quarters of the way done when we uh, when we uh, completed it. It had more uh, on, the, on the upper side of the picture. You can see where there's some scat, some framing set up there. That was finished, and then there was a floor for over the uh, that end of it. Is there, there's more at the end of the day. Okay, so we can have more up here. That's you. That's you. So, there were, by my count, five times on this trip where I was in actual serious danger. There were a couple more that seemed like it, but it turned out it wasn't so bad. And there were probably more when I wasn't being <coughs> But 
one of the times was when I went back to Manila to get or to meet my mom there. And for her, the Manila airport probably didn't seem that bad because she had somebody who knew where they were going at that point. But the first time we were there, some parts of it were pretty scary. Um, I went and looked this week, just a brief history of Manila Airport. In 2010, they built a new terminal. In 2011, they decided they needed to add running water to their new terminal. 2012, the roof of one of the old terminals fell in. 2013, one of the floors of the new terminal fell in. And in 2014, a mayor was assassinated there. So it's not a nice place. So Tuesday night of now the beginning of our second week there, I got on a plane to Puerto Rico and flew back to Manila. And from the schedules that I had, I thought I was going to have six hours between when I landed and when my mom landed. So I was trying to figure out what am I going to do in Manila. I don't want to just sit in the Manila airport for six hours. And the people that were there told me, oh, there's the Mall of Asia. It's great. You can go hop in a ta taxi and go to the Mall of Asia for a few hours. So they told me, okay, go in this line for the metered cabs, because if you just go and get in any random cab, they'll charge you an arm and a leg to go around the block. But if you go in the metered cabs, then you'll get a fair price. So I got to the airport and checked, and my flight was an hour later than I thought it was. So now I'm down to five hours. And then my mom's flight was getting in an hour earlier than I thought because of the time change. So now I'm down to four hours. So I get through and I get into the airport and it's still, my flight is delayed. And it ends up being delayed about an hour. So now I'm down to three hours by the time I land in Manila. And by the time I actually got out to where I could do something, it was down to about two hours before my mom's flight landed. But I still figured, okay, Mall of Asia, it's like three miles from here. I can go spend an hour there, come back, no problem. So I go and get in the metered taxi line, and I would guess there were about 150 people in line, and I stood there for about half an hour, and not a single metered taxi came. So I'm thinking, well, this isn't, just gonna, this isn't gonna work. But there were other taxi drivers that would walk up and down the terminal and look for anybody who looked like a foreigner and say, taxi, taxi, you know, and give you a price. And so finally one of them said 500 pesos for the Mall of Asia. I'm thinking, okay, that's, that's not so bad. That's $10 roughly. So I say, sure. And he says, okay, wait here. I have to find somebody else. He wants to take two people. So another 20 minutes go by, and finally they take, I get in a cab to the Mall of Asia. And I ask him how long this can take. And I thought he said 13 minutes. So I'm thinking, okay. No problem, I'll spend 45 minutes at the Mall of Asia, turn around and come back. 45 minutes later, I assumed that he must have said 30 minutes, not 13, because I could still see the airport behind me. <laughs> After about an hour and a half, I got to the Mall of Asia. So now my mom's flight is landing in roughly 40 minutes, and it just took me an hour and 20 minutes to get there. So I thought, well, I'm here, she's gonna have to go through security, I'm at least going to go inside and look around a little bit. So this is the Mall of Asia. Oh, wow. It is much bigger than that picture makes it look. It is almost a mile long. Um, so I got off. You can see right about here, there's that giant globe. That, that globe is, I don't know, it's got to be 150 feet tall. It's huge. That's where I got off. So I went in and I turned left and ended up over here somewhere. And after about 20 minutes of thinking, okay, I need to find a cab and get back to the airport or I'm gonna miss my mom and this whole thing will be for nothing. So I find a security guard because everywhere you go there, there's security guards, like carrying shotguns at every store in the cities because that's how it is. Manila is a really dangerous place. So I find a security guard to say, where can I go to find a cab? By this time I've run so far, I don't remember how to get back to where I got dropped off. And he says, go down this way. You just keep going that way and you'll get to where the cabs are. So I go that way and I get out of the mall and I go across the street and there's all of these buses and things that are this place and that place, but there's no cabs anywhere. So I keep going a little farther and by now I'm 
well outside of the Mall of Asia to where things are getting a little more sketchy and I still have not seen a single cab. So at this point I'm praying quite a bit because by now I'm going to be late, I don't have a cab, I don't know where I am. So I turn and start heading back towards the mall and I cross the street and I'm looking around and this cab pulls up next to me and says, need a ride, sir? I'm thinking, okay, so I was praying, here's a cab, don't know how legitimate this cab is, but I'm going to get in. So I get in this cab and he says, 200 pesos to take me back to the airport. After, it just cost me 500 to get to the Mall of Asia. So I'm thinking, yes, perfect. But I'm still going to be late. But this guy was so much a better driver than the first guy. Um, I got back to the airport about 15 minutes after my mom landed. So she was still going through security and everything. But at the terminal she was coming in, but the plan was to meet her at her terminal, and then get on the shuttle, which was a crazy, crazy ride, to one of the other terminals where we were going to fly from. There were four different levels at this place. The bottom level was where you had to wait if you were coming to pick somebody up from that terminal. And the second level was where taxis dropped off people for departures. The third level was where people actually came out from their flights. And then the fourth level was where taxis would pick up people that were coming out from their flights. So I got dropped off on the second level, and I'm trying to find my way up to the third level. And I cannot find a way up there. I ended up on the fourth level and all the way back down to the first level, but I couldn't get to the third level. So I got back to the second level, and I finally found a ramp that goes up to where my mom's going to be coming out. And the security guard says, no, you can't go up there. I'm thinking, great. They won't let me up there because I didn't come into this terminal. It was only for people that had flown there. I wasn't allowed to go there. So I'm praying again, and I sent my mom probably 10 emails hoping that she would get one, telling her where I was, where she had to come to get to where I was. It was probably almost an hour that I was waiting there for her before she found her way down, ended up on the opposite end of the terminal from where I was, but we were finally on the same level. So I went over there and found her, and I had talked, there was ramps on both sides, I had talked to both security guards, and one on one end said that I couldn't go up there, I just couldn't. And the guy on the other end said, your mom comes down, I'll let you go back up with her. So I'm waiting by the nice guy. <laughs> and she came down on the other end by the not so nice guy. But we managed to talk him into kind of, I don't know if he understood what was going on, but I went up anyway. <laughs> so we got on the shuttle and we made it back to, our, to the flight and we made it to Puerto. And this is, this is about what we experienced the first time we went through. Um, it wasn't nearly as bad when I went there with my mom because we found a place where the restaurant area was, and there wasn't nearly so many people, but it was an experience. Okay, so yeah, just briefly a little bit more about that day. Um, when I got there, when, when they left the week before me, the only communication we had was email. Um, so that's kind of sporadic and you can't just ask a question about what was in their email because it's probably going to be two days before you get an answer back and they forgot. Um, but my instruction, he had given me as much instructions as possible and basically told me, ask questions every single place you go. Make sure you know where you're going before you go. So I got there, I was able to follow the instructions, um, collect all my luggage and everything. Um, but then I had bought a tablet so I would have email. Well, I needed to get this to work in a foreign country. And I always have Alex to fix things so I don't learn how. Um, so I went up to, I found an information desk and I just said, I need help getting email, I need to meet somebody here. And he's telling me this or this and this didn't work and this didn't work. And I kept asking questions like, I'm not leaving until this works. Um, and finally I just handed it to him and he was able to go to web, some website and do things and finally got it to work so I was getting emails. I don't know that I got all of them, but I had a couple from Alex. Um, 
The one that scared me the most was the one that said, my battery is dying on my laptop, I may not be able to communicate anymore. <laughs> so, um, and I knew there was, he had one with kind of where he was, there was one before it, but because they were back and forth, it would only show me the latest one. And it turns out after I found him that the one before that told me specifically where I needed to be. Um, but I asked everybody I saw um, before I went out any door, I made sure that that's where I needed to go because I knew that they probably wouldn't let me back in if I went the wrong way. So at one point, they told me to go out this door and there were guards outside the door, so I talked to them again and yes, go across the street, down the ramp to your right. So okay, I did that. And that's where I thought I was supposed to meet Alex. Well, I waited and I waited. And I'm walking around and there's people across the street and I'm trying to see and be able to make out the people, look for a tall blonde person amongst the other people. And I finally walked down and up above me was a sign that said like X, Y, Z. So I thought, well, Z makes sense, I'll wait here. Well, I finally walked down the ways and I walked down to like GH or whatever and this is silly, walk back. Well, it turns out that that's where Alex had been is down by D and E, so I hadn't gone quite far enough, but we found each other. Um, we got through the, the shuttle and <coughs> into the other terminal where we needed to be. Um, we went and found restaurants and stuff, but then when we went back to where we needed to, to go to get our tickets and check in our luggage and stuff, it was the middle of the night, so nothing was open and everybody's just laying everywhere on the floor, so um, we had to kind of wait for that. So we finally got there, um, got to Porto in the city. Um, this picture here is actually um, where they took me for breakfast. Um, it was kind of like a little fast food thing, and I'm like, well, okay, egg and cheese sandwich sounds pretty normal. Well, it's about this big, and the sandwich part, which you would normally get a biscuit or something, was actually pancakes. So it was a little strange. Um, Jeff had gotten a meal, and of course with the meal you don't get french fries or hash browns, you get a pile of white rice. Um, from there we went, and um, because we, there were only two vehicles at the compound, the chariot, which you saw, and then they had, um, it was basically like a Ford Ranger truck. Um, that they used, but there were so many uses for these vehicles and all the tools had to come back at night and be locked up that if you wanted to do something and just get out away from the compound, you couldn't. So they had decided that they were going to rent bikes. When I first got this information, the email, and they're telling me, and we can go here, and this is 25 miles away, and this is this far, and I'm thinking, I can't ride a bike that far. I haven't ridden a bike since I was in high school. Turned out they were motorcycles, so that made it easier. Um, so we got those, and I think a lot of you probably heard Jaden's story. Um, but just real quickly, we hadn't had them for very long, and the traffic is just in and out, and you go wherever. There's, there's no lanes, even if there's, the oncoming traffic is like right next to you, there's no center. And if you decide to pass, they kind of just move over, and the people coming for it, and, of course, we're not used to that, so. But we were in a place where we were trying to keep up with people because we didn't know we were, where we were going. So we were trying, there was an opening, so we were going to pass on the left. And Jaden had been like in front of us over. At the same time, he decided he was going to come over and pass. And he actually turned into me. Um, his handlebars hit my arms, but he wiped out. Um, and that was scary because, of course, you're bumper to bumper traffic everywhere. And I was really worried that people behind would run him over. Um, but we got up where we could pull over. Unfortunately, he was already up with his bike. Um, he had lots and lots of road rash. But he did okay. So that was part of the reason for the medical supplies we sent back. Um, then we went. Um, I think I have a picture of it. Well, this is just um, some things that I saw probably while we were getting the bikes or in town, kind of what the city looked like. Um, this is an apartment complex. 
and they had rented two of the apartments here. So when people were in town, um, they kind of had a base to work on. They were very small, but they had air conditioning. And if you sat um, kind of in front of where those clothes are hanging, there was a little porch area, and if you sat there, you could get internet. And that was our pretty much the only place we could go while we were there to communicate back and forth with people here. Um, while we were there, um, they had put, they had brought the truck to put my luggage and stuff in. And we were there for a little while, and it was decided that the truck was going to go back, and we had to ch exchange some money, and we were going to go get groceries and things like that. Um, and I had been wearing, I wear contacts, but I had my glasses in the whole trip. Um, because you can't wear contacts that long. And I was gonna, I thought, oh, I'm gonna go in the bag and get my stuff and my sunglasses and different, put some drops in my eyes or whatever. Well, just at that time when I was trying to reach over and open one of my suitcases to start digging, they came out and I didn't wanna hold them up or anything because I didn't know where my stuff was for sure, so I just said, well, just leave it, you know, we'll be there in a couple hours. Um, that proved to be a mistake, but I'll go back to that. Um, so we went to, there was a mall, and it had an ATM machine outside of it. Um, that's where Alex went to um, withdraw some money. And he had done it once before. Well, it kept his card and gave him a receipt that he got the money, but he got no money. Um, so we found out what had happened was when he had done it the first time, it had alerted somebody somewhere and they had marked his car as being stolen. So that's why they kept it. So we were able to talk to people and found out we needed to go to the bank at three o'clock that afternoon to get his car back and get it straightened out. Um, so we were kind of, at that point, stuck in town most of the day. Um, we went in the mall for a while. That, there's a grocery store in there, so we bought groceries and things. Um, we just spent time around during the day, um, kind of waiting. Um, I remember we walked, walked the street somewhat, and there was like a skateboard park, and we'd stop and watch the people there and things like that. Um, we did at one point go, they had a, a Shakey's restaurant. Um, so we went there and had lunch. I didn't realize it, but Kevin and Solomon were leaving that same day after we ate, which I didn't even say goodbye because I didn't realize that they were leaving that day. Um, so after 3 o'clock when we finally did get Alex's card and stuff, um, and all the escapades with the bikes, Jeff had just said, um, you guys go on ahead. He kind of knew the exit we needed. We needed to go about 60 kilometers out of town where we were staying. And he said, we'll just come at our own pace. And they could go on ahead. Well, we went about halfway, and all of a sudden the road just got really, really shaky. And we pulled over, and we had flat tire. So now we're kind of in the middle of nowhere with a flat tire in a foreign country. Um, not quite sure what to do. So we waited for a while, and coming over a hill, we saw a couple pushing a, pushing a bike also. And they were coming toward us, so when they got to us, they stopped. And they also had a flat tire. And they knew there were these signs along the road with tires, and it said vulcanizing. Well, apparently, because of the heat, this happens a lot. And so every five miles or so, they probably had a little place. I never seen any people buy them, but they had the places and the signs. Um, so they were walking to one of these places, so we started walking with them. They did have a cell phone, and the lady did speak pretty good English. Um, so we had our receipt for renting the bike, so she tried calling. Um, one number was out of service, the next one didn't answer. Um, and she had sent a text. So as we're walking, um, the guy, I don't know if he called her or he texted her, but anyway, all of a sudden they're talking, and then she gave the phone to Jeff. And at first, he kind of says, well, flat tire is kind of your, your problem once you rent the bike. Well, we found out that we had just rented it, just received it, and, you know, where we were. He said he would bring us another bike in 15 minutes. 
Well, knowing that we were more than 15 minutes out of town, we knew it was going to be a while. Um, so we're kind of waiting there, looking around, and I kind of, my big fear going there was snakes. Um, so I'm looking around, and as where we're standing along, the, uh, this is the National Highway, but it's basically a two-lane paved road, and it has a shoulder. And behind me, I'm looking, and there's what we would call like a deer trail or something here. It was an opening where you could see things went, and I'm thinking, what kind of things use this trail? <laughs> um, but we waited, it was about an hour and 15 minutes, we had no other choice, and the, the person did actually show up with the bike, switched it with us. I said, what are you gonna do now? You're stuck with a bike, uh, bike with a flat tire, and he kind of just says, well, I'll slide down somebody and get a ride, so. Um, <clears throat> we got back, um, it was probably close to dark that evening. Um, to find where we were going and stuff. Um, this is just a picture of the bike, so I'm not sure where it was. Um, but when I got back, that's in the city. And that's the place we. That's the place that Jeff and I stayed in. Um, okay. Um, as as I had talked about my my contacts and stuff before. Um, they had gotten really, really sore through the day. Um, at one point when we stopped, I put sunscreen and stuff on it. I thought, well, I must have just touched it and got sunscreen in my eyes. But they were really burning. They were getting cloudy where I couldn't see. So I got back and found my stuff and put saline in them, which normally feels wonderful. And it stung and it hurt. And I thought, this is really strange. Something's wrong. Um, made sure I had the right bottle, that I wasn't putting something else in, and talked to, fortunately, I was with two nurses and talked to them, and we had come to the conclusion that I had actually sunburnt my eyes during the day. Um, and I looked it up when we got back, and it is actually something that, that happens. I actually read an article about it happening on a movie set or something, but... Um, so they were extremely sore, swollen, um, just pussy, um, hard to see anything, so I dealt with that for probably four or five days. Um, but the next day, we, we worked on the job site, as he said, we were framing the doorways and stuff, and we did pour some cement. Um, in my notes, I had just quickly written down our breakfast that day was pancakes, which was quite unusual for there. And I thought this was kind of funny, just in my notes, I put eggs with onions and something yellow. <laughs> Um, lunch was rice and some kind of bean mixture, similar to lentils, um, green beans and squash chunks, and what I call hash browns, which were actually some kind of root that they um, shaved up and fried together. It was very crunchy, but it looked similar to hash browns. Um, they had rice there at every meal. Normally, you know, I said here we had pancakes, but normally breakfast was the different, no difference than any other meal. It was rice and something fried. Um, so that, that day then, um, we took, there was a, a waterfall. If I got pictures. This is um, the, the bathroom that they had built. Um, the one stall on the right is um, the bathroom, and then the other two were two showers that we could use. Um, and this is the building they built for the two um, groups of students that were coming. It was just basically a big bunk house. It just had bamboo racks where they, where they slept on, I mean, on both sides. And that just kind of shows a little further out our, our <coughs> compound chairs in the area. is kind of where we sat, had our meals, um, the tree on the left. That kind of goes out to the side. That was the monkey place that you avoided at all costs. Um, I was told when I got there that the monkey was eating. Um, and there it is. The place in the back is um, the house that the pastor there lives in. Um, also, right in that door is actually a garage door. 
Um, but Alex and Jaden, then they put a bunk bed in, inside there, in a, like a sheet. And Alex and Jaden slept there, and then there was a room on the right where Travis and Michelle stayed. Um, that's the inside of our, um, it had a little sink, but it was only about this deep, and the water was way up here, so it came down and just splattered everywhere. <laughs> Um, and that's the bench inside. We used it to keep our suitcases on, but as Jeff said, somebody had to sleep there at one point. Um, and up on the top there is where Jaden slept. And you can see this is all open to any kind of creatures that wanted to walk in and out freely. Okay, this is where we went to the waterfall. It was probably an hour, hour and a half away on the bikes. Um, up in the mountains, it was beautiful. Um, however, it was mountain water. <laughs> um, to us, it sometimes felt good, but after you've been riding on the, it was actually very cold. Um, so you'd get in about halfway. Some of them were braver than I was. Um, but again, on the way back, um, you know, my eyes at that point, I could barely see anything. Um, and on the way back, we stopped in the Orland, which is um, a town nearby, um, but they had a market there. Um, on Sunday they would come and have a big market. Um, that's some of the, lots of fruits and vegetables, um, fish that, um, there were places that smelled so bad it was, you had to just hold your nose and walk through very quickly. Um, piles of raw chickens, chicken parts, big heap of just chicken claws, um, there was a big case with a pig in it, um, rows and rows, you can see a lot of different fish and stuff here, just all out in the open. But again, it was, um, I didn't realize that, that we'd be back there, but I kind of thought, well, this is the only time I'm going to be here, and at that point, I could basically see nothing, and it was evening, so I told Jeff, I says, don't let go of me, I'm basically blind. I could kind of make out the part, parts of buildings, but I couldn't see anything specific. Um, they found a little, you can see the Nestle sign or whatever in the background there. Um, they sold like packaged ice cream and it had a bakery, so the guys liked to go there. Um, and again, that's all like dried fish. It looks, it looks like they just chop it in half, and let it dry. Um, okay, and this is back to the building. Um, this was on the next day then. Um, we finished framing. This was, this was at the top of the building. There's about half a part of the building where we actually poured a second floor, a second story. Um, so this was putting in the footings for that, and then we poured it that day. Um, and we actually had to, because you can't have any of the cement get dry before you get to it, we actually had to start in the corner and have two people come out from there, so we ended in one place, and we really didn't have enough people that day for what we were trying to do. Because um, you actually had, we mixed, everything was in a cement mixer by hand, um, then it was dumped into wheelbarrows, taken to where you want it. You had to shovel it into buckets, and then you had to hand buckets up three layers to the people um, by you. Um, I actually got sick this day. Um, I wasn't, I guess I wasn't used to the heat and used to working like that. And I went, whenever I'd walk and get a drink or whatever, I'd be really dizzy, which I was getting used to that. But um, I hadn't planned on sitting. I was just going to get a drink and go back to work. And I sat down for a minute. And all of a sudden, it's like I literally couldn't breathe in. I just, my chest just, I couldn't take in air. And so then I had to sit. And um, eventually they finished and found me and watered me down with the hose. And I don't think it was heat stroke because I recovered fairly quick and was able to do things. But. Um, it was kind of interesting. We all kind of had our day when, when we didn't feel good. Um, I'll try to move this along a little bit here. 
Um, the other thing we found is this was a beach and it was about a 10 minute ride down the road from where we stayed. So a lot of days after we were working, we would just go to the beach. Um, I even found because of the lack of water and what it took to wash our clothes and stuff, I basically used two sets of clothes for working. And I would wear them during the day. We would go to the beach, I would just go in in my clothes and that was as clean as they got. Um, hang them up to dry, wear the other set the next day and back and forth. Um, that just seemed to work out the best. Um, they had a volleyball court, um, they had cabanas there, which you had to pay to go in there, but then they brought you like water and stuff like that. We only did that the first time we went. Otherwise, we could just go to the end of the street and walk right out on the beach. So that was, that was very nice, a nice way to end our day a lot of times. Um, and the guys, of course, played football, and when they had the academy kids there, they, they had a good time doing that. And then that evening, um, we kind of, it was Friday, we had kind of a vespers just around where we were. And they were, they were very formal about, we were just sitting in a circle and they had to all of a sudden, you were having special music and you are giving a talk and you are singing this and you are having this prayer and very formal about it. Well, then we got done with that and they started talking about Sabbath. And we knew Alex was going to be preaching, but all of a sudden they decided that they were going to a second church in the afternoon somewhere else, and they needed a second person to give a sermon, and they needed a Sabbath school teacher, and this was like 9 o'clock at night. And, you know, they were very firm about somebody has to do this, and um, even when you get there, you basically walk in church, and they have their pencil and paper, and they look at you, and Melody, you're doing opening prayer. And Lonnie, you're doing special music. And they would just write your name down, and that's all there was to it. There was no talking. Or, um, I, we kind of had thought about doing that today, but we didn't want to scare you. <laughs> um, okay, so I will... So when we got there, this was how, the two, this and the chariot were the two ways of getting around. So like she said, we decided that we wanted to get bikes because otherwise, you know, we'd work and we'd be done working at 4 or 5 in the evening and we'd just be stuck there with nothing to do. So we decided to get bikes, but I wanted to show you a little bit of what you could expect to see on the roads in the Philippines. This video is from En Puerto, and it's pretty... Play. I guess it's not going to play. But you can see they actually have speakers like attached to the top of the vehicles. That was really common. And in this uh, video, they actually, these guys started dancing for the people to take them in the video. Uh, this was a pretty average load on a, uh, oh, there we go. This is just something that you see on the roads there. <laughs> and then this was on the International Highway. This was not a very heavy load, honestly. I saw one van or one bus that had at least 150 people. They were hanging up the windows on the inside, and the entire top was covered on this bus. My dad was actually the first one to give the bikes a try. This was the first Sabbath afternoon. Um, that would be him and Kevin. <laughs> so I think that's when he decided that he definitely wanted to get a bike because otherwise he has to ride like that. Um, so when you were out in the country, riding the bikes was a lot of fun and it could be in the city too. Um, that first day when we got the bikes and my card got kept by the ATM machine, they told us go to the bank and get your card back there. But I didn't know where I was going, so Kevin said, I do, follow me. So we're in and out of traffic, like crazy, both sides of the road. And the traffic in Puerto is so heavy 
that if you're trying to turn onto a street, you're never going to if you wait for an opening. There just aren't any. So when people decide they've waited long enough, they just go. Doesn't matter what's coming. So me and Kevin are going in and out of traffic, flying down the road, and suddenly a truck pulls out right in front of him, and I'm just behind him. So he slams on his brakes, and I slam on mine, and the left brake was the rear wheel, and the right brake was the front wheel, and that was the only time that I ever used the front brake because that's, your gas was also there. So if you reach forward to grab the front brake, you have a tendency to also hit more gas. So I did that, and I turned the bike sideways and almost laid it down. I didn't fall or get hurt or anything, but that was a really close call. Um, but driving out in the country was a lot more fun. Um, this is right here. I'm going about 60 kilometers an hour, which wasn't really that fast. It looks pretty fast in the video, though. Um, because of the condition of the roads and the bikes we were on, Kilometers and miles seem pretty interchangeable when you're talking about it. 60 kilometers an hour on a bike feels like 60 miles an hour in a car, basically. So, driving at night, though, was kind of scary. You see right here, I'm coming up behind one of those trikes that doesn't have any rear lights, and that's really common. Most vehicles have no rear lights, and the light on the bike doesn't do much. You'll also see coming up here, I'm about to cross a bridge, that is under construction, right here, it's suddenly just dirt. And then it goes back on the bridge, and as I'm getting off the bridge here, watch on the left. See if I can pause it at the right spot. You see this right here? That's a hole in the bridge. They have planks across it for a car to drive over the planks, but the hole is big enough for a bike to go through. And that is pretty common. So, we all had some troubles with the bikes, but they were a lot of fun. They let us go and do a lot of fun things. So back to Sabbath. This is the oven that we had church service in. Um, it was at least 110 degrees every day we were there, and when you went in this building, you suddenly lost any chance of breeze. So we got there, and I had known, the first day I got there, before we even left the airport, Travis told me, you're ready to preach, right? And I'm thinking, about that. I, you know, I didn't come prepared to preach, but I said that I would, and I figured that I would reuse my sermon that I used here about John 5. And you might remember that when I spoke about John 5, the week before that, David Rawls was here, and he also spoke about John 5. But no, it wasn't David Rawls. It was John Peterson. But anyway, two weeks in a row we had a sermon here on the same topic. Well, the first week we were there, Rob Falkenberg Jr. spoke about John 5. <laughs> so I don't know what it is about that sermon, but I guess I can't keep using it or somebody's going to use it the week before me. Um, so Jaden ended up teaching Sabbath school that day. He found out about that, like Mom said, 9 o'clock the night before. Uh, special music, they didn't have planned ahead. So basically, at the beginning of church, somebody in the front row turns around and starts whispering to figure out who's going to do all the parts of church. And I don't know why they whisper, because they're talking to everybody. But that's what they do. And they write about that, and then somebody stands up at the front and announces, like what you read in the bulletin, and they go through who's going to do each part of church. So the second week we were there, Jaden got to do Sabbath school, and my dad was an elder, and I needed the sermon. So it wasn't exactly what we were expecting, but that's how it ended up. Um, Sunday we worked, and then Monday and Tuesday were our two vacation days. So the first day we went to do what they called island hopping. We went to this little harbor and you got in a boat. This is the boat we were in and there were, I want to say seven islands that you could pick from and I think we paid to go to three of them. You just pick and tell the boat driver where you want to go and they'll take you there. Each island has different things you can do. Some have like a banana boat you can go on, some have a lot you can jump off of, some have snorkeling. So this is just out the harbor, you see this sunken boat. There were a lot of those around. 
But the first island we went to was called Starfish Island because there were tons of starfish. Um, it doesn't look real big, but this starfish was probably about like this. And it wasn't the biggest one that we saw. There were lots and lots of them. We went snorkeling out a little deeper, and we found some places with some really cool fish that we could see all over. I got some video from this first one. I ended up deciding that by the end of our island hopping, I had seen the entire cast of Finding Nemo. <laughs> And I'm actually serious about that. I saw every kind of fish that you see in Finding Nemo, minus the sharks. So that was our first island. Um, so we hopped back in the boat, and we went to a second island where we ate lunch, and then we had this cabana thing, where this was the view we had from our cabana. You can see we went there to get lots of great exercise. But we sat around for a while, and then Travis decided that he wanted to go in the water. So they had a roped area for swimming and we could see a really dark line about halfway out. We're trying to figure out what that line is. So Travis went swimming up there. It's a line of seaweed, and there's all kinds of cool fish and stuff in there, so we go out there, and eventually we started venturing outside of the roped area because that's where there was some really cool stuff. Um, we ended up seeing sea urchins that were about like this. No joke, they were huge. Um, all kinds of cool fish. I actually got bit a couple times. I think bunch of us did. There were just so many fish there. Um, so that was the end. We decided to just stay there instead of going to a third island. So we went back to the harbor and we got on the bikes and went about 45 kilometers, I'd say, to a place called 67th Heaven, which for us, after having been there a week and a half, really was heaven. Um, we had supper there. Uh, my dad and I had steak and I think everybody else had fish. The fish was a big fish like this that they would cut open, cut the guts out, and they stuffed it with some vegetables or whatever, wrapped it in banana leaves and cooked it, and that's how it was served on a plate, the whole fish like that. And the steak that we had was the best steak I've ever had in my life. I don't know if it's because I missed real food or if it was really that good, but it was delicious. And then at the end of supper, they took our breakfast order and said, what do you want for breakfast and when do you want? And we came in the next morning and what we ordered was sitting right in our spot where we had sat the night before. But this is where we had stayed. I think there were eight places there that you could stay, the little cabins. Um, we were the only ones there that night. So this is one of the little cabins. We had hot running water, soft beds. It was really great. You don't realize how much you appreciate those things until you don't have them. But this was right on the beach. So this is actually the view from the porch of my parents' cabin. You can see right around the beach there. So that was a really great experience. And that was the end of our first vacation day. Michelle had been taking this video of me doing this. 
All I do is there tell him he go slow and take one step at a time, otherwise normally a ladder would bother me. Um, other things, there was one place, I've got a picture coming up, where we had to rappel down a narrow little part, and again, it's dark, you have no idea what's behind you, what you're supposed to be doing. Um, there was a place where you kind of had to jump over a 300 foot drop off, um, and I watched Michelle do it, and the place that you had to stand to jump was a little rock that was shaped like this. And she was on this point trying, and it's um, very muddy, very slippery in here. Um, we were just caked in this stuff. And I, I didn't know if I could do that watching her. So they says, well, come around this way. I'm like, well, why are we doing this if I can go around? But we walked around, well, as I got to the other side, then they were over here, but they're here, there's a huge pillar. And so I actually had to swing myself around the pillar. Um, so I probably would have been better off jumping, but it was dark, so I didn't know. <laughs> um, there was one other place where we had to go through basically a little duck walk. You had to get way on the ground and try to lift your feet up. And I was a little bit too big where I tried to lift my foot up and my back was hitting the top. So I actually just got down and did an army crawl through this little, um, you know, I could kind of go through there. Um, and that's Jeff going, repelling through the little area. Um, there were, you know, it was an experience. We had to climb a mountain to get to the cave. We had to, um, it was beautiful inside, but with it being dark, um, it was hard to take pictures and stuff. Um, and of course, you needed your hands free, so if you wanted to take a picture, you had to stop and get your camera out. And um, I, It's hard to tell from that photo, but we were totally filthy. And this was a cave full of bats, so um, we weren't really crawling through mud. Um, and that was a group, we took a picture of the group when we left. We did leave them an offering, um, and we prayed with them. Um, they were hoping to open in a couple of months to the public um, and give these tours and, of course, have safety equipment and lights and things. Um, then we went, we were going to the underground river. Um, I got a couple photos of that. It's kind of like one of the not the wonders of the world or something like that, but it, it's really something to see. Um, we had lunch. This is kind of an open restaurant right before we went on. Um, watch where this is an open restaurant over a buffet. And watch what's going to happen in the video where Alex has it pointed out there. if you saw that real well, but that was a real rat. Um, and it turns out it was going back and forth and down to a corner, and it had babies. It was a mother rat. And one at a time, it was going and getting one of its babies and going back up and across the buffet and us and going and taking and moving its baby somewhere else, and then it would go back and, and do the same thing. Um, Okay, this is getting a boat to the underground river. That's us in the, our other boat when we got there. Um, and that's, that's the entrance. And once we get in again, it was, um, it was beautiful, it was dark, and they didn't want to talk, so we had ear things to disturb all the bats that were also in this cave. Um, and I won't spend a lot of time on it again. Um, after what we've been through at the other place, it kind of lost some of its excitement. Um, then the other thing that they wanted us to do, this is a zip line. And we had kind of says, you know, we don't need to do that. This is actually Alex going on his. Um, but again, it was climbing another mountain. Um, and at that point, I kind of says, well, so much has happened to me today, 
what more can <laughs> why not? Um, so we did that. It was beautiful, um, but I kept looking at all this jagged rocks directly underneath me, and I thought it was going to be like a free fall, and they're just going to let you go. But it was actually more controlled. You can see that you're not really moving extremely fast, but it was very nice. And then you'll see these things on the rope here. That's actually their braking system. They were like wood pegs on the cable we were coming down. Oh, okay, it's in the wheel. And they threw those out there, and running into that was how they were supposed to stop you. <laughs> um, I believe this is probably Jeff coming in. Um, a little bit of scenery when we left there. Um, we actually, well, our, our boat was then supposed to take us from the zip line back to where we had started. Well, for some reason, I'm not sure what happened, but they didn't want to do that. So we actually had to walk a couple miles along the beach to get back. Um, then we left on our bikes to go back to the city. Um, and that was the only time we had rain. It was very, very dry and dusty. But that was fortunate because then there were no mosquitoes. Um, but we did run into rain going through the mountain here, and it was a hard rain. It felt like you were being hailed on. Um, and then, so we got back to town, we got back to the apartment. It's not had been a long day with all this stuff going on. Um, I really just wanted to stay there and go to sleep, but they wanted to go eat, and they also um, needed to take, Jaden was leaving early in the morning, so we needed to take his bike back. And they needed Alex to go so that Jaden could ride on Alex's bike to get back to the apartment. So they told us, they left right away because the gentleman was meeting us there. And we followed a little bit behind and they said, go to the third light, turn left. Well, we did that and we couldn't find our people. We couldn't find the bike shop. Um, it was dark, it was night. We kept going down this road, um, finally got to a place where we were getting out of town and we knew that this is not a place we should be. Turned around, we went, we went back and forth along this road probably about five times. Finally we thought, well maybe we were supposed to go through the third light and then turn left. So we tried that and back and forth and no way to communicate. Um, I was pretty frustrated because all I could think about in the town with all these people was somebody was going to take off my leg on this bike. <laughs> um, it was just, it was not a good experience. Eventually, we just decided they weren't there and we, I guess they knew where the restaurant was. So we thought, well, let's go try there. And it turns out they had, they had dropped off the bike before we got there and just went and waited for us at the restaurant. Um, so that night we finally got back to, I was never so glad to get off that bike and back to the apartment. Um, and now this is the same day yet that we've been in the cave in the morning and we just wanted a bed and a shower. And their water there, they had signs like between like 9 and noon it was always turned off and whenever else they felt like it during the day. So of course we got there and no water. Um, so we went out, we used the internet for a while, and for some gave up and went to bed. Um, fortunately, the water didn't come back on later, so we were able to take showers. Yeah, what you're seeing here is Michelle taking video riding with Travis. He's actually driving pretty safe during this video compared to some of the other times. Um, this is pretty average traffic in Puerto. It got a lot heavier than this sometimes. I'd say this is about what it was like when the time she was talking about, except it was dark. So imagine driving around in this in the dark when half the vehicles have no lights and your lights don't do any good, and it was, it was not fun. So uh, like she said, the next morning Jaden left, so we, we missed him. At this point, me and Dad had been there for two weeks and Mom had been there for a week. 
And the next day, I think Jade left because he knew that the next day was the day we were starting to pour that upper floor. Um, you can see here's the house, and this half over here is what we were going to pour the next day. Um, do you remember how much pound it was? 50,000 pounds is what Travis figured we had to lift up one bucket at a time to that upper level. Um, so the way that we had to do this was we had all of these supports that we put under the plywood that we were holding it up. And this is pretty much what we had to do. We would mix it, dump it into a wheelbarrow, wheel the wheelbarrow over to the scaffolding, shovel it into buckets, buckets go up, buckets come back down. And you keep doing that for 50 some thousand pounds. Um, this was actually, each of us had one work day that we didn't make it out very well. This was the day that I didn't make it out. Um, I had been wheeling wheelbarrows, and there were three of us, actually, I think it was just two of us at this time, at this point, wheeling three wheelbarrows. So I had filled my wheelbarrow and pulled it back and was waiting for the wheelbarrow in front of me to finish unloading, so I sat down. And Mom actually tapped me on the shoulder and said, hey, they're ready to go. I had been you know, looking down, I was pretty tired. So I got up and pushed the wheelbarrow maybe 20 feet forward, and I knew something was wrong right away. So I turned, and just to the left of where I'm standing there, um, what's her name? Uh, Laura. Laura was standing there, so I asked. I went over and asked her if she could take over for me with the wheelbarrow. And in the 10, 15 feet that I walked, I, I was dizzy. I couldn't see anything. It felt like I was stumbling, and my speech was slurred. I don't know what I looked like, but I had to catch something, or I was going to fall over. It was uh, not a great experience. So she had to take over for me for a while. This is from the other side, seeing how the process worked, just one bucket at a time. Um, from the top, you can see how they pour it. And this took us, I don't know, we started pretty early in the morning, and it was mid-afternoon doing this constantly, keeping the mixer running before we finished. Um, the end result of this day looked kind of like this. We've all seen his arm, but it still looks like how many months later, but he had concrete burns all over him. So that was on Thursday. Friday we set up the second half to be poured, and then we decided to go to the waterfall again, because it was hot, you know, the waterfall's cold, it was really nice, and he couldn't go in the ocean because of his burns. And the waterfall was fresh water. So we decided to go there, and we got about 15 kilometers from the waterfall, and my bike goes, how about, how about, how about, and I break down. And I'm at the back at this point. Since they had broke down that first day, I made sure that they were in front of me because I didn't want to lose them yet. Because we had, I had gone looking for them that first day and wasn't finding them. So here I am, finger on my horn, beep, 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 as everybody drives away as my bike goes slower and slower. Thankfully, they realized it came back from me pretty soon. But we spent the rest of Friday evening trying to get my bike to work. Eventually, uh, Travis and Michelle took their bike back to. Uh, where we were staying and got the chariot and we loaded my bike into the chariot and brought it back. Um, just to stop for a minute to show you a few of our souvenirs. This was the room that my mom got, the kind of the old handmade. Um,
And then my favorite thing, I managed to get a machete. <laughs> so if you guys want to see this stuff, I'm sure we'll have it on the counter. Um, so then Sabbath came, and the pastor Edgar Espinosa that Sabbath preached his first sermon in English. That was pretty cool that he did that for us. And so we're getting through the sermon, and through the, the uh, service, and we had had offering and uh, scripture and whatever. And a, a girl gets up front who's telling everything that she says. And now uh, Travis and Michelle are going to have special music. <laughs> and they looked at each other like, what? But eventually, realizing that there was no turning away from it, they got up and they sang special music together. <laughs> and that was just how it worked then. At the end of our talk, um, this is during the last part of the war. This is the last day that we have it coming. Huh? We got to do this. All right, we're looking at that's how fast we had to work to get the thing done before it came out. That's why I, I put last all day because they worked so hard when we were there. Um, we need to close this thing up. It's run way past time, so I'm just going to end with this verse. It says that there were many. Also many things, other things, that Jesus did, or you could put the Zeezers did, uh, that the witch, that if they were all written down, they would come up and that to be in the books. Yeah. And so, we're going to just move on from that. I had a bunch of stuff I was going to talk about, but we're going to, we're going to yeah. close the service. Yes? We did have a lot of, we have local help too? We did have, um, on the last four that you saw on the high speed, that was local help helping us. The groups from Canada were gone back already and Travis said we need to get that part finished where we're working on right there in the video. And uh, so Edgar had gone out and hired seven local helpers and they were uh, God sent for us because they were really part of it. Jeff, how many how much did the blue buckets that you raised up way up how much cement did that hold? How much normally they put two big shovelfuls in each one? Guessing just how many pounds per per best bucket. Uh, 20 pounds maybe a much or so and we had to raise them higher than your head so and there was small people doing that as well as big people. The last day I was uh, working on wheelbarrow and, and there was three of us doing wheelbarrows and I actually went down and got sick like the rest of them had done earlier and Michelle and Alex took over the three wheelbarrows while I just stayed there doing nothing. Um, like I said there's so much that you could tell you couldn't we just barely skipped on the surface of what happened when we were there but um, we did decide that we should probably um, try to keep the project going over there. So we'd like to take an offer when we did the the uh, building this morning, uh, actually this afternoon already, because right now the project has slowed down to a crawl, a crawl almost, because the funds have been depleted. They are the last we heard just a few days ago. They are head down to just two workers that they can afford uh, for this next week, and it only takes. Uh, $10 a day to hire two workers over there. And so if we can make a difference and keep that project moving. We are running back September, late September, early October, I hope, to uh, build cabinets and place them, put them in place and pour the floors and that sort of thing. We'll probably be gone for uh, four to six weeks. And we can learn what the product looks like now. You see there, yeah, that's the latest picture right there. The upper part will be a roof over with the open with the railing room. That's a place where they can go and be nice and cool. Because uh, there is no shade trees right around there. There's the one tree that's got the water tower in it. That's the only tree that's close to the house. I, I think we should probably close up uh, by having prayer. And uh, then, like I said, um, we are going back. And, October to try and get this house going so that the missionaries can be doing what missionaries do instead of work on house every day. So let's just pray. All right, Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for our time that we got to spend in the Philippines and for the, for the magnitude of the project. Heavenly Father, we see great potential over there and we just pray that you bless and get upon you. 
Uh, be with us here as we continue this day in this fellowship. Uh, be with us as we partake of the food this afternoon and the fellowship together. And we just want to leave it all in your guarantee.